as we, we have listened to victory in Jesus. That is our message of hope, that there is victory in Jesus and that our God saves. We sing the chorus of this every week, but this week we're going to sing the whole song. Let's stand together as we praise the Lord together. In the name of the Father,
Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Well, as we sing, and hopefully that's the reason that you're here today, is the fact that our God saves, and you understand that. If not, you have the opportunity to understand that in a, in a personal way as we go throughout our service today. But let the fact that our God saves lead us to tell them. When you came in today, or as you sat down, you were given a card. It looks just like this one. And I want to call your attention to that and encourage you to fill this card out. February the 18th is our, the start of our revival services. We're just a few weeks away from that now. And on that day, you were encouraged to invite your one. 80% of people tell us that they are interested and willing to go to church if they were just invited. So think about that one person that God's placed on your heart, on your mind today, or, or throughout the week, or other days, that you would invite to be here with you on that day. And just encourage you to fill this out, to sign your name on it as your commitment, and you'll see, that, see what it says. But leave that on your pew, or we'll talk about how else you can turn that in here as we go throughout our service this morning, but want to ask you to commit to tell them. There may be opportunities for you to have a gospel-centered conversation with individuals. This is just simply asking them to come to church with you on that particular day where they will hear the gospel in a clear way. So as we've been talking, why are we here? Why, what do we do? Why do we do it? And talking about the priorities we have as a church, today we look at the fact that we're called to share, and that's to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And we all know that. Everybody who's a believer in the Lord knows that. Yet how often we do not do that would probably characterize our life. So I want to call your attention to this and ask for you to make that commitment. And then I'm glad you're here today, that you're ready to join us in worship. Your heart's prepared to do that. And you'll notice when you came in and you got your bulletin, it's a little different. It doesn't have the flap on it any longer. But what you may not have noticed is that there still is a perforated section for you to complete if you're a guest here today, thank you for being here. We just ask that you would take the back of your bulletin, that you would fill that out and tear that off and place it in the offering plate. If for anyone, there's a way for you to submit a prayer request. And there's a new line down at the bottom. As you know, we offer online and text to give. And giving is in our response to the Lord, in our worship. And so that's why we have our offering at the end of the service as we respond to the Lord. Well, if you give online or you text to give, you've already done that. You don't have a way in which to give something in the plate. So this is your way. This is how you can mark that. And as part of your worship, your response to the Lord, you can just place that in the plate. And you can give in the other means that we have. So just want to call your attention to that. And then you probably don't have to call your attention. Your eyes are focused on the front. Everybody's dressed alike. It's not some, they haven't drank the Kool-Aid or anything and, and signing up for something weird. But it is the end of, of D-Now. Our students have been here with other students from other churches across the county uh, all weekend. And uh, so Aaron's going to share a little bit about what's happened this weekend. And he's going to lead us in our prayer as we prepare our hearts to worship and as we pray for these students as they return back to normal as we wrap up this morning. And um, some of us put on some t-shirts and some of us put on uh, our, our suits or our, our shirts and uh, out of just the normalcy what we always do what many of us have done time after time week after week we came to church this morning and and this Wednesday many of us are going to come to church this Wednesday to prayer meeting or, or to youth group. Um, because on this day when someone walks into the sanctuary and they look at you they would say you have some semblance of faith. Uh, you're here and, and you probably call yourself a Christian. But who are you tomorrow? And who are you the next day? Uh, who are you on the days that you don't normally go to church? Who are you on the days when you're not a part of something that's here at your church, that's a mission trip or, or a camp or, or whatever? And so that, that's what our students were looking at this, this weekend. Their everyday normal faith. Who am I when no one's looking? And so if we're going to be Christians with, of integrity, then who we are uh, on Sunday and on Wednesday and when we talk about God is who we are when we're around people who don't know the Lord. Uh, and so I was talking to someone today and they said, uh, man, this is one of the best denials that I've ever been to. And I, I told him, man, we don't know that yet. And here's the reason why. Because while we've had some really cool things happen this weekend, we've had a lot of students come, we've had people make some decisions about their life, transforming decisions 
what, we will know if, if this was good in a month. And so many of you, I've spoken to you over the, the coming, the, the months leading up to this weekend, and, and you said, hey, I'm praying for you. I, I've gotten text messages this morning. I got text messages Friday. Hey, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your kids. And so I want to challenge you as a church now, if you haven't been praying leading up to the now, start praying now. Start praying that our students will be changed, that they would say, hey, I don't want just a, a faith that I wear as a t-shirt. I don't want just a faith that I put on my social media. I want every single day to live for Christ. And two, that may be something that you, you, could, you could commit yourself to as well. You know, maybe, maybe you need to take a look at your life and see, um, would I do better to have an everyday faith? Let's pray for these students and, and pray for our service this morning. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for a chance to come together, Lord, and, and just worship you. And so most of all, that's what we're here to do this morning, is to lift your name on high, God. And, and we thank you that we've been able to do that throughout this whole weekend. But now, God, we just ask that, um, that you would uh, help our students who, who have committed to, to be transformed, to be changed, to, to live for you in every waking moment, to live for you when their parents tell them to do something they don't feel like doing, or to live for you when someone around them is gossiping, or to live for you at their locker or in their classroom, Lord, that they would partake in things that would glorify you and lift you up, and Lord, that they would call out those other believers around them to do the same. Lord, I pray that, they, that, that you would encourage them, God, and that you would give them the strength to, con to continue to do that, Lord, and let that just infiltrate our church as a whole, Lord. That all those who are sitting here now and saying, man, I, I could be a part of that, Lord. I pray that they would understand that they are called to be your followers, not just two or three times a week, but every waking moment of their life. Bless our time here, God, and we pray that you're blessed. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. Just what he said right there, songs we're about to sing, talk about the message we have to give. And it's a testimony of what we like to do with that. Unfortunately, we often just sing it, and then we walk and go in our own way. So thank you for that message, Aaron. We encourage all of us. May these songs be something that we are out in the world doing, that we are out sharing every day of our life. Let's stand together. Two old hymns, I will sing the wonder story, and I love to tell the story. <laughs>
think I will. <clears throat> First Samuel chapter 30, if you have your copy of God's Word, join us there. First Samuel chapter 30. As they begin to sing that, I begin to think about my grandmother only had one living grandparent in my life, and she was older throughout my life. And uh, my grandmother, when I surrendered to preach, my grandmother told me that she had always prayed that one of her sons, that God would call one of them to preach. She had four boys, and if you knew those four, you'd know how comical that is. And when God didn't call any of those four, she began praying that God would call one of her grandsons to preach. And if you knew my cousins, you would know how comical that is. But I begin to oftentimes think about God answering the prayer of my grandmother and wonder, grandparents, parents, have you prayed for God to call one of your sons or your grandsons to preach? Probably not, if we're honest. Because in the priority of sharing, it's probably the priority that we do the least of in our life. We talk about worship, we would say we come here, that we worship, and that worship is part of our life. We could say that we grow, and you could talk about various aspects of growing. You could say that maybe you serve a little bit. Hopefully you see as we go down, the, you get the fewer and fewer participants in these priorities. Worship would be the most, we would say, grow, serve, but then to share. To share makes us think about, are we truly preaching the word? And that's not just to be the preachers, but all of us are called to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to fulfill the great commission, to go and to make disciples. But share makes us also consider, what are we doing with the things that we have? How do we use our resources? It brings up the idea of stewardship. How do we use our gifts? How do we use the things that God has given us in kingdom work? Well, today as we look at the idea of share, I want us to look at a story in 1 Samuel chapter 30 that you're probably unfamiliar with, but we see a time 
of the importance of rescuing those who are lost. Look with me, beginning in 1 Samuel 30, verse 1. We're told that David and his men reached Ziglag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziglag. They had attacked Ziglag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziglag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Anohim of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and honors. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abathar the priest, the son of Ameliach, bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. You know, when you go out of town for years, we've always had things to take care of. Someone had to, to pick up the mail. Uh, to get your newspaper out of the driveway so that people wouldn't know that you were gone. If you had pets, that's a whole other spectrum of things you have to get taken care of before you can leave town. But over the last few years, there's been a rise in house sitters, people who will actually come stay at your house while you're gone. And in major re- metropolitan areas are told that there are even some people who are house sitters who don't have a home of their own. They're just dependent upon always being booked to go stay in someone else's home. But why did that come? Well, people began to realize when Others were gone on vacation that their home was wide open. And then as social media came and we began to publicize when we were gone, and really a smart idea, but uh, it was really open that your house, no one's there. You may have a dog, but we can take care of Fido. You may have some, something else there, but you are not there. And we can come and we can take everything that's out, that's in, in your home, we can take it out. And so many people have experienced that, sadly, of coming home to find that their house has been ransacked. And that's what David found in this passage. After seeing his fame rise following the slain of Goliath, David has become the target of Saul, the king. And Saul is out to destroy David. And so therefore, David has been on the run. Spent much of the last few years running from Saul. In the last year and four months, he has actually spent with the Philistines. He has connected with their king and has told him, I'm pledging allegiance to you. And now the Philistines are on their way to attack the Israelites and attack King Saul. And we put the story together, they're about to kill Saul. This is the battle in which Saul is going to lose his his life. And so God is allowing that time the Philistines to, to win. And here is David about to go attack the Philistines, his own people, and the king, which he has had the opportunity to kill and has not. And so God works for David to be released to go back home because the other Philistine commanders begin to think, you know what, he could turn on us at any moment. He wins against us every single time. And so David and his men are sent home. You would imagine among make great relief because it was about a 55-mile trek home and the Philistines were heading up north about 55 miles as well where they were going to engage battle with the Israelites. And so David and his men head back south 55 miles and they get home. And can you imagine the excitement that they had? Anybody who's ever been away from home much, especially men, and you you miss your wife and your kids and you can't wait to get back home, you know that you drive a little faster. You don't stop as often as you have to or as you may if you had the family with you. And so these 55 miles, we're told, take them about three days. On the third day, they get home. And no doubt they're elated at being home, that they can't wait to get home and to hug the wife and hug the kids, but they find that in their absence, the Amalekites had burned David's recently acquired city to the ground. This was no doubt in retaliation for the attacks that David and his men have carried out against the Amalekites in the last 16 months as they've been with the Philistines. They did the same thing to their towns. But this time they knew David was going to be gone. And so they waited for the right moment when no one would be there to carry out this attack while the men were gone. But before they burned the city, they took all the inhabitants and made them captives. 
Now, this doesn't mean that they valued their life. It doesn't mean there was some sort of sympathy within them for the reason they didn't kill all the, the children and the women. Rather, they probably took them as a bargaining tool. Maybe David will give a little more if I've got the wife and the kids. Or probably they intended to sell them as slaves. There was no mercy among these individuals. And so you may look at that passage and go, okay, Clint, get to the point. What does this have to do with us? Well, just as the enemy came and took from David and his men, the enemy, Satan, has come, and he's taken from our wives, our kids, and from our husbands. Scripture tells us that Satan came to kill, to steal, and to destroy, and that's what he has done in our life. He has came many times when the men were not home, and it wasn't for a spiritual reason, but Satan has came in, and he's carried off the women and the children to be used as he so determines. He's burst in on places and he's taken off a lot of men as well. He's using men the way he wants to use them. And they're living for him. And we know that ultimately these men and women, and boys and girls, are destined for hell. And it's your and my responsibility for us to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. It's our responsibility to go to them and to rescue them. To go to them understanding That they are facing hell. And that the enemy has come and he has stolen their joy. And he's taking their life and he's trying to take their eternal life. And we must be the one to go and to share the story that changes lives. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And we don't do that very good. If we're honest. Case in point. You would probably be ashamed if I asked you to stand up if you filled out this card. Most of you got this, and when I pointed it out, you threw it down in the pew beside you where it'll stay, or you stuck it in your Bible. But you had, and you still have, no intentions of filling that out and inviting your one to come to church with you in a few weeks. We've forgotten that the enemy has come, and he has stolen people's lives from them. And it's our responsibility To go to them. So how do we do that? How do we rescue those who are taken away? Well, David shows us how in this passage. First of all, we must weep for the right reason. I pray that I never know the feeling that David and his men have. As they stand at their home and see that everything is gone. And not just possessions, but to know that your wife is gone. Or in David's case, multiple. None of us plan to have but but one. To stand there and know that your children have been taken away. And then when he sees this, he didn't know who did it. He finds that out later. And to stand there and see that everything that you worked for, everything that was precious to you, everything that you loved was gone. David led his men to do many things, and now he leads them to grieve. Here's some of the toughest things. Men on the planet, weeping, and verse 4 says, until they were exhausted, until they had no strength left with which to weep. Now, we've been told for years, men, that real men don't cry. And we know that not to be true, that if you do, you just need to make sure there's at least three closed doors between you and the people who may find you crying. But real men don't cry. One magazine, though, recently determined set up some rules for when men could cry. Consider these. It's okay to cry if you're in extreme pain, such as a piano being dropped 50 foot on your your feet. Then it's okay for you to cry. They said the pain level must reach at least eight if you're going to cry. It's okay for you to cry at certain works of art or film. For instance, if you don't get at least misty-eyed at Toy Story 3, you're a monster. If you don't cry when you hold your baby for the first time, there's something wrong with you, the article says. But a lady wrote it, and she ended it by saying, never ever cry in an argument, for the women already got the corner market on that, okay? Now I want you to think about David and his men. Weeping until they have no strength left. They're not crying because they were tricked. They're not crying Because they wish they would have wiped the Melekites out when they had the chance. They're not crying because they wish they were back with the Philistines in battle. 
They're not crying for any other reason. They're not crying because their possessions are gone. They are weeping because it was personal. Their children and their wives had been taken away. And it hit them in the heart. And they wept for the right reason. When was the last time, church, you wept because the enemy took away the souls of men, women, and children? We need to learn to weep for the right reason. We get upset over the acts of Congress more than we get upset over the lost kids in our community. We show more concern over a lost dog than we do lost people facing eternity in hell. We get more wrapped up when things don't go our way and the ball game doesn't turn out and our team fails than we do on the condition of people in our families, in our classes, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, within our spirit of influence that are facing hell. When is the last time you wept for the right reason? Could it be, could it be the reason we don't weep, that our hearts do not break for the lost, is because we have forgotten the hell from which we have been saved? That we live without any real acknowledgement of the reality of hell. Listen to me today, hell is a real place with real people, and it is a certain destination for the one who is not a child of God. It is a place of agony. It is a place of unrelenting pain. It is a place of unrelenting fire. And it is a place without escape. And it is the certain destination for those who do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. And just that little bit that we know about hell ought to leave us to weep for those who do not know Jesus. One of the greatest privileges I have as a pastor is to be right there. Baptizing people as they make the profession of faith public. One of the greatest frustrations is this microphone that I'm wearing today. But one of the greatest privileges I have is to be right there. But I'm not there nearly enough. So several years ago, I decided that if I wasn't filling the baptistry up with water to baptize people, then it would be my tears that filled the baptistry up. And that's one of my places to escape to. And to come in here and pray when nobody's here. Asking God to do a work and for us to see people saved. But when was the last time you wept for the right reason? That your children and your grandchildren and students, your classmates, are facing eternity in hell. When was the last time you wept that that grocery store clerk that you're frustrated with, or that woman taking your order at the drive through that can't seem to get it right, that that person is going to hell without Jesus. When is the last time that you just stop to consider the reality of hell and that if the Lord were to come back today in Yazoo County alone, over 50% of the people would die and go to hell? See, we sang the song earlier, I love to tell the story. And you flat out lied, most of us. It's an awesome story of what Jesus has done for us, but it's not a story that we share. And we won't until we break our hearts and we weep for the right reason. Secondly, in order to rescue those taken away, we must fight the right enemy. See, it's not enough that David has lost his wife and his children. Now his own men, for the first time, begin to question his leadership. They say, we're told in verse 6, that David was greatly distressed because they were talking of stoning him. These men that he had led so successfully since the first 400 joined him, now there's 600 of them. They have all attached themselves to David and now they find themselves worse off than when they first attached themselves to him. All of David's successes among these people have been undone by this disaster. And their bitterness turned to blame. I mean, David was, after all, the one who made the plans to go raid these other cities that made the people upset and, and had them come and turn against him. It wasn't entirely unreasonable for the people to look and go, he's the problem, and point their fingers at David. 
But their bitterness is so severe that they're now talking of stoning their leader. Think about it. They are considering stoning someone who is just like them. Someone who is hurting. Someone who has lost everything that they had. Someone who had nothing to do with their circumstances. And they're looking at him and they're going to stone one that is just like them. They had the wrong enemy. The right enemy was the Amalekites. They're the ones who came in and took the people. The real enemy was not David. See, we spend lots of time fighting various wrongs, but we must understand that the enemy is Satan, the father of all wrong. The night that Jesus was arrested, Peter couldn't take it anymore. He had watched his Lord's anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane as the Lord prayed. He had watched a group of soldiers come in and arrest Jesus. And so Peter took out his sword and he took a swing and he removed the ear of the high priest servant. In a way, I don't blame him. Knowing the frustration he was going through and that he had a weapon, he just simply used what was at his disposal. And I had to think if I was at the right situation with the weapon, I would have done the same thing. But Jesus looked at him and he didn't commend him. He didn't look at him and say, boy, you're brave. He told Peter to put the sword away. Poor Peter. You know, he's always in trouble. He's always putting his foot in his mouth. He's always speaking up when he should have been quiet. And on this particular day, Peter failed to realize that he was fighting the wrong enemy. Our enemies are not flesh and blood, the Bible says, but principalities and powers. We're told in Ephesians chapter 6. And our enemies cannot be defeated by ordinary measures. Far too often we try to take things in our own hands and we're, we try to assist God. Kind of help God out a little bit here. As Christians, we're too quick to protest and not as quick to pray. We're too quick to pick it and not quick enough to preach and to focus on what God has primarily called us to do. We need to realize we are fighting a spiritual battle and therefore we need to use spiritual weapons parents listen to me today is your kids disobey you and your kids frustrate you and your kids never do what you tell them to do you can fight and argue with them and but you're fighting the wrong enemy the enemy is satan and that's the struggle that we all have husbands and wives you can't see them to get on the same page it's not each other's fault Man, husband, it's not her fault. Wife, it's not his fault. Instead, we need to understand that Satan is the author of confusion. And that's the enemy that we fight, not one another. See, so often I see things, our community, and it upsets me. See the way people act. Now, I go to any ball game here, any school in the county, and I learn new cuss words. Every time I go, or combinations of them, by reading lips. And I always think, you know what? Why is that parent not doing something? But it's not their fault. It's Satan. And most of those saying those things don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why they act the way they do. When I see people commit crimes, a lot of times, yes, out of stupidity, but the bottom line is they don't know Jesus. Their life has not been transformed. Because the Bible tells us we cannot live with certain things in our life. And say we're a child of God. So today if there's unrepentant sin in your life and you're okay with that, you're okay with things that have a hold of you and you're just going to tolerate them, I say one thing and that's that you're lost. And we're talking about you that the enemy has come and is stolen away. And you are facing eternity in hell. And I don't care how many times you prayed a prayer or you've been baptized, whatever else spiritual that you've done. The right, the right enemy is not you. The right enemy is the devil who has control of your life. And that's what we must fight against. And so therefore, we need to quit calling congressmen and quit doing all that stuff we so focus upon. And we need to hit our knees. And we need to be in prayer. And our hearts need to break. And we need to weep for the right reason and fight the right enemy. Or those who have been taken away will stay gone and face eternity in hell. But Clint, that's hard to do. Maybe your parent, you're going, but you know what? You don't know how my teenager is going to act. Or your grandparent going, I'd love to have that conversation with my adult child. 
And so that leads us to the third one. You have to find the strength to be a leader. And how do you find that strength? David shows us that that strength is found in the Lord. David is standing before 600 men who are ready to stone him because they have lost everything. David has heartbroken himself because he has lost everything that was dear to him. And David has no one to turn to. He can't call the Philistine army because they're pursuing the Israelites. He can't call the Israelite army and Saul because he's being defended and about to lose his life against the Philistines. David feels all alone. And he turns to the Lord for strength in verse 6. He found strength in the Lord his God. And it's out of that that he got the strength to lead his people. The Hebrew word for found strength also means to grasp hold of or to find courage. But David grasped hold of the Lord his God. David found courage in the Lord his God. Here David found strength in the one who was promised that he would be the king over Israel. The strength that David found was trust in God's promise. And that's simply what we call faith. He just trusted that God was going to do what God had told him he was going to do. David knew to turn to the Lord. I mean, he lived his life in such a way as he stood before Goliath, a great giant. He said, the battle is not ours, the battle is the Lord's. And that's why he laid aside the armor that didn't fit him. It didn't fit into what they said a soldier was supposed to look like, but that he fought in the power of God. As he's running from Saul, there were times he could have taken Saul's own life, but he knew what God intended for him to do, and he wasn't supposed to have that blood on his hands, and so he did not kill him. Instead, he stayed dependent, finding his strength from the Lord. His life was marked by a trust in God. And Saul, he's just opposite. See, during this time, Saul is about to be killed, about the same time that David and his men get home. And Saul begins to inquire of the Lord. He realizes he needs help. But yet he found that in that moment that God had abandoned him. In that moment of desperation, he turned to illegitimate means to discern God's will, even attempting to conjure up the dead. Because Saul didn't have the strength to be a leader. Some of you today, you're tired, you're frustrated. You're having a tough time being a leader. Soon as some of y'all, God has spoke to you, done a work in your life this weekend, and you're about to go home, and you know when you get there, it's going to be nothing but greater frustration because nobody is going to support you when you get there. Listen to me today. Look to the Lord for the strength that you need. Parents, you're tired. You're tired of constantly saying no, constantly being the bad guy, constantly being the one that your kids don't like because of the standards that you're expecting out of them, look to the Lord for the strength that you need. Regardless of where we find ourselves trying to be faithful and we get tired, we get frustrated, whether the position that you're in or just a responsibility has been entrusted to you or an opportunity that God has placed in front of you, we cannot rescue those who have been taken away until we look to Him for the strength that we need to be the leader that He's called us to be. And when we do that, you will find that his promises to you have not changed. That he didn't go, you know what, I really didn't mean that when we started. That God's not going to look at you and go, you know what, I've decided not to strengthen you today. But that instead, God's going to look and give you what you need. And so David, after he sought the Lord and he found strength in him, he asked for the priest to be brought and he took the priestly, priestly garment, and we're not told how it happened. But David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding army? Do I go after them? Will I overtake them? And we see, fourthly, what happens. If we're going to rescue those taken away, we have to pursue and recover the lost. The answer he got from the Lord, pursue them. Pursue them, and you will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David's faith finds expression in concrete actions that will reverse this seemingly hopeless situation. Pursue them. Not stand back and wait and see what happens, but go after them. The enemy, Satan, has come in. He has hauled off much from us. He has stolen our families. He's stolen our communities. 
He's taken a whole lot of things along the way. And you and I can sit back and we can let it happen. Or we can ask God, God, what do I do about it? And God's response is going to be, pursue them. Go after them. And you will succeed in the rescue. Pursue. This is not a gentle search. This is not hide and seek. This is not just go look at the obvious places. But this is the idea of a chase. It's a word of considerable effort and focus. And that is what you and I must do. For so long, we just sat here and said, well, y'all come. You know, these people, they know where we are. If they want to have their life changed, they can come here. Would you be willing to admit that hadn't worked? We must pursue them. We must recover what has been lost. The result, well, if you have your Bible it's still open, you look in chapter 30, verse 17. We told that David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing. Young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken, David brought everything back. And that's what you and I will discover in a spiritual sense. That when we're willing to go and pursue the lost, we are rescuing them out of the grips of hell. And there will be none lost. I mentioned to you last week that at the heart of who we are, Southern Baptists, is the Great Commission. And yet as a denomination, our baptisms are the lowest they've been in 70 years. Why? Well, as we talked last week, we're not willing to do whatever it takes. And part of doing whatever it takes means that we commit to be people who share the gospel that has changed our life. And so there we stand today. Another one of those messages that tells you you need to share your faith. And another time we really may be convicted that we haven't and maybe we make good intentions. If somebody right now were about to run in, if they ran in the back door and they hollered at us that their, a car was stranded on the tracks out here and a train was coming, I imagine just about everybody that was able would jump up and run out there to offer some assistance. And the others that were maybe not able to or whatever reason, somebody eventually would say, you know what, we, we ought to pray. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to run out there. And I imagine when we get there and we pull them out of their car or we get the car off the track and we come back in here and share what has happened, that there would be great celebration and great relief. And I would imagine that after we pulled them out, if the train came and it hit that car and you heard the crash and then we came in and announced, but the people were out, that we would see weeping because you thought the people were dead. And there would be great celebration. Because they had been saved. In reality, our community could pour in here and holler that they are stuck on the wrong path of life. They are stuck on the wrong tracks. And that judgment is coming toward them. Why aren't we so eager to run out and to rescue? Because our hearts hadn't been broken. And we don't weep. For the right reason. So would today be any different than other times you've heard about sharing? Would today be different than other times when you've heard about missions that we're involved in or ways that we can impact our community? I'm going to start with that card that you were given earlier. What about that one that God's laid on your heart? Maybe they came to mind instantly because you think of that person all the time. And you do weep for that person. But again, most of us, I safely estimate, didn't do anything with it. Let our hearts break. Let us weep. Because those people, your sons, your daughters, your husbands, your wives, your grandchildren, are going to hell without Jesus. And let's quit fighting their actions and realize that he's the enemy. That's the reason they act the way that they do. It's because they're lost. And let's step up and be the leader that God intends for us to do and go after them.
Would you bow with me? Holy God, break our hearts today that there are people that we know that if the train of judgment you return today would face eternity separated from you. God, let us do what it takes to pursue them. Thank you for the promise of the success that you bring if we're just obedient. Would you continue that prayer today? What's going to have to happen in your life for you to share what God has done? Again, you may be here today and you realize that you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've realized that you're the enemy. People have been attacking, telling you you need to straighten up, you need to change things. And today you realize that it's because the one who has control of your life, that's the real enemy. But you can break free from that today by admitting to God that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and that he is the one who died on the cross for your sins. And he rose three days later. And you just confess him as the Lord, the boss of your life. Would you turn your eyes on him today? Father, across this place, have your will in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together? And as part of our commitment today, I call you back to that card. Maybe you want to take that card and it's got your name and that person you're going to invite. You want to come place it on the altar as your commitment that you're going to do whatever it takes to get your one here on that particular day. Maybe you hadn't thought about it at all. You simply just need to fill it out and leave it where you are. Most importantly, let us be committed to be people who share what God has done in our life. Let us turn our eyes on Jesus for the motivation that we need today. If you have a public decision, would you come quickly as we sing? Oh, so are you bow with me. I want to ask you today are you not being the leader you're supposed to be because you're tired? Frustrated? Maybe that's what spoke to you today. Would you do what we've seen and would you turn your eyes on Jesus? Would you look to him? 
Would you let him know? He already knows your heart. But acknowledge, I'm tired. I need help. Would you look to him for the help that he needs, that you need, that will come from him? Father, we thank you for the message you brought this day in us. Lord, may we not be guilty of leaving this place and not be changed. Father, may we all be obedient. Lord, I ask you to make me obedient to share your goodness, to share your mercy, to share your love, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. May we not keep it to ourselves. Father, we would pray that you would change our community. Lord, we start on our knees and pray that, Lord, you would use us to be agents of change as we share you wherever we may go. Father, as we give of our offerings once again, we pray that you will use it. You will use it for your glory. Use it to share the gospel around the world. In Jesus' name.
As always, it's been an honor to worship with you today. I hope that you are, know what's in your bulletin and ways we have to be together and continue to worship, grow, serve, and share together. And I get plugged into those as you have the opportunity to do so. If you're one of our parents and you're staying for our parent luncheon, you registered for that. If you would, as we wrap up here, if you would make your way to the fellowship hall, and we'll begin there. We want to use your time wisely, and so we make that commitment to you today. Before we go, Miss Pat, if you would come, and uh, just you up here makes me hungry. All the good food you've provided for me through the years, and uh, it's led up to that today that Mrs. Pat has been here, uh, that she desires membership in our church and promise of a letter from Second Baptist Church in Houston. And uh, so I know that you're going to welcome her, you're going to accept her, and uh, you're going to love her. And if she cooks for you, you'll even love her more. And uh, so if you are going to pray for her and you're going to welcome her and accept her and grow together with her, would you raise your hand as a demonstration of that? And Ms. Pat, you see folks are glad to have you. You can put those down. And uh, as always, at the end, if you would stand here after we sing and uh, let them come and welcome you officially into our church family. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I'll let you have a seat there for the time being. And so, students, you're going home. Your parents probably are not ready for you to come back home, but you're going to go home. And I, I want our commitment to be for you, for, for you to know that you have a church that's praying for you. And uh, so, church, let that be our commitment as we depart today. So let's stand together and let's declare that our God saves one more time today as we conclude this morning. Our God.